uh, tools to help implement the standards, support the implementation and improvement of the standards, establish results that facilitate benchmarks, and also provides a platform for organizations to demonstrate where they are um, uh, in terms of the, in terms of the standards and the application of the standards. So um, many of you are familiar. Next slide, please, with this little circle. Um, this is the. Uh, it used to be the Universal Standards for Social Performance Management and uh, it is now evolved into the universal very recently actually earlier this year evolved into the universal standards for social and environmental performance uh, management and this is really the core of, of of what we do and there are standards that have been established for putting the clients and the environment at the center of all the decisions and uh, the, the decisions that we that we that we make as financial service as financial service providers so uh, naturally uh, on the next slide uh, it's important for us first to understand the context around digitization and there's been a, a marked shift towards digitization we've been observing this over the last couple of years this has gained impetus as a result of the pandemic we all know this um, and as organizations rapidly digitize we need to ensure that this is done with the intent of balancing client needs and preferences as well as uh, financial service provider imperatives such as growth and returns and so it's necessary that we we really define what is considered to be as good practice when it comes to digital financial services. It's necessary to ensure transparency in digital financial services, understand client level risks and provide solutions, help identify organizations that want to balance um, value creation for all stakeholders, including both at client level as well as the investor level, and also encourage knowledge sharing and partnership on best practices. Next slide, please. We've been engaged um, uh, now, you know, um, for a better part of of last year and 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 early this year as well. In 2021, we did a document review, looked at different resources that are out there uh, from CGAP, GSMA, Women's World Banking, USAID, IFC, for example. September to February, we spent time to sp speaking to many industry experts. Um, 40 of them, around 40 of them to be to be exact, of which there were a number of financial service providers as well. And earlier this year, in February 2022, uh, we launched the Digital uh, Financial Services Working Group, uh, and the work on that, uh, you know, is 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 really something that's that's going to continue on throughout uh, this year. So the rider to my presentation is that this is still very much a work in progress, and um, uh, uh, you know we are looking forward to engaging more with you uh, as as the year uh, moves on. And so the standards still haven't been set, but we have the first draft. And the first draft, which is on the next slide, um, a snapshot of it, has 13 primary sections. And I think it's it should also be um, uh, in the chat box because I've asked uh, Burok to, to put up the document in the chat box um, uh, because it's been provided. So you can download it from there or from the SPTA website. But the 13 primary sections that are there, a lot of these will be familiar to you. Um, you will clearly see that uh, six onwards, the topics include, uh, are, the topics are very much about client protection standards um, and are very much there already in the universal standards for social and environmental protection. There are other ideas that have also emerged. Interoperability, for example, is one of them. So these are the different sections that are still very much under review uh, for the responsible inclusive standards. Now, as we get into this, uh, we've had some very interesting questions that came up uh, that have come up, uh, you know, um, in the working group. And I'm going to share some of these questions with you and sort of deep dive uh, into certain specific areas um, of the standards. Uh, the first question is, um, you know, what are the DFS standards and who are they actually for? Well, they're for FS, FSPs and fintechs alike that are offering digital financial services and want to really create value for clients and investors. Um, these standards can also be incorporated into the due diligence of uh, of, uh, of investors who are keen to understand whether or not the response, whether or not the practices related to digital finance are responsible uh, for their investing investing companies. Then uh, the second question, of course, that arises is, um, uh, and it's important to note that 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 if you are a DFS provider, do you only use uh, the DFS standards or do you use the USS EPM as well? Do you use both? So it's important to note here that the DFS standards are complementary 
to the US as CPM, they don't replace them. If you are providing digital financial services, everything in the US as CPM applies to, applies to you as a financial service provider as well. Uh, but there are additional consumer protection risks that are inherent in using digital delivery channels. And it's important that we acknowledge that and also account for that when we are trying to be a responsible organizations. Uh, financial service providers are of course in various stages of digitization, we recognize that. Uh, they're on a continuum. Example, some have digitized only internal processes, some, have, um, of, some offer only digital payments, some offer digital credit. Um, you know, FSPs will really have to address uh, and assess um, uh, its practice against the indicators that that are supplied in the responsible digital financial standards, uh, and and which ones are those are which one of those are relevant for them at, at, at different points in the in 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 their own trajectory. Then, when you look at the next one, I want to give a concrete example, a few concrete examples over here. The first one is that of consume of 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 complaint mechanism. Many of you would have seen this in the universal standards. There's one standard here which is uh, that the provider receives and resolves the complaints. There are three, three essential practices under this, which is that there is a mechanism for complaint re resolution, that when the complaint comes in, it's actually resolved, and then the data from the complaint gets used for refining products and processes, right? Um, so these are the current standards and, and the essential practices. Um, this will still very much apply to the digital financial services that are being offered, but there are additionalities as well when it comes to complaint handling, right? So uh, on the next slide, these additionalities have been presented. Uh, complaints uh, related to, uh, to partner organizations, uh, example, payment service providers, these have to be accounted for. Uh, clients should know that they can come to an FSP and file a complaint about partner organizations. Um, uh, customer service employees in a financial service uh, institution must know how partner organization complaint systems work rather than just saying this is managed by an external agency, so please contact them separately. This is This we feel is inadequate. Uh, there should be training of agents on responding to complaints, even if they're third party agents. Um, complaint mechanisms in an FSP should be able to capture complaints that are registered by agents. Um, um, it's also equally important to define who in the financial service setup will be the contact point for complaint resolution provided by partner agencies. A lot of what is additional in these standards is related to handling, to, to handling complaints involving third parties. A second example is that of client-centered products and services in the universal standards. There is one standard again, which is the providers products and services and channels benefit the clients. Uh, and there are five essential practices under all of these, right? So, which is that there are the, the, the provider uses insights from data to design products. Um, it removes barriers to access for clients. Uh, it ensures that the products and services do no harm and that uh, it reduces the vulnerability and shock and smooths consumption and also the providers products and services help clients achieve their goals. So this is the base. It still applies very much to all digital service providers. The additionality to this that is being considered is uh, on the next slide, which is the digital skills are necessary to account for, right? Smart, mere smartphone ownership we find now is, 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 is inadequate. So it's important to account for digital skills. An approach uh, to developing digital skills can be based on customer journey and different touch points with a financial service provider. Keeping clients informed about their transactions is also equally important. This also has a key role to play in building confidence in digital services and also critical for uptake of digital financial services. One has to be clear about the opt-out clause. Um, ensure that there are pilot tests for solutions developed. It's not just a cut-paste hash job that we've seen oftentimes done in financial services. Incorporate digital skills assessment and market research as well and standardize data collection on this. So these are some examples of uh, of uh, of uh, of responsible digital financial standards that we are that we are looking at. They apply on the next slide. You'll see another question. They apply to fintechs, as I've already mentioned, uh, as they also want to mitigate harm. Uh, how to implement is very much up to each entity, whether it's an FSP or a fintech, and it's the growth trajectory. We are aware that there are additional practices as well, especially linked to fintechs over there, based on and based on different business models. So we are very keen to hear about these practices. And on that note, um, uh, as I said, this is still very much a live project for us. We do have a digital financial services standard working group. Uh, my colleague Amelia's email ID is there. Um, uh, it, you know, the information is very much there on, on our website as well. Um, so you're welcome to join the working group and to also provide and also to understand where we are currently in the journey as we develop standards for digital financial services, uh, responsible digital financial services. So on that note, I will transfer over to my colleague, Hema. Thank you.
uh, basically um, in the start you know the results that I'm going to kind of project today um, talk about is based on the on an FMO study that was conducted uh, by Isabel Barris and myself uh, who was then with the smart campaign um, it, the idea was to really kind of update the due diligence tools of the FMO um, so uh, what in this today's presentation I think uh, what we're trying to achieve is uh, next slide please uh, what we're trying to achieve is, uh, you know, mitigating, how do you kind of mitigate risk in a digital age? So what is the approach? And uh, also then I'm going to try and see how as a rating agency um, and a consulting firm, how do we kind of dovetail our efforts um, in trying to kind of unbundle some of the very complicated uh, finan digital financial services models that we have. Uh, so uh, that's basically the agenda. Um, and uh, moving forward, you know, uh, uh, just a little bit about at the analog to digital. Um, so uh, what what is actually the difference that you see between the analog and digital? So uh, when you are looking at a uh, digital revolution and consumers, you basically look at, you know, some of the risk. And what is that shift that tends to happen? So during the what has changed from an analog world? Of course, you see all of that women in the group to moving to a woman alone doing a digital transactions. Perhaps that's changed, but you know, products have changed. The new channels that have really come in, new processes and you know, interactions have changed. You know, you previously you were interacting with humans, now you interact with interfaces. Uh, there's more partners, there's more competition. Uh, the funders, the, the governance has changed, the funders have changed. Um, and lastly, what's changed also is the rules of the game. So there are different re regulations and there are different rules. So overall, there is a shift from analog to digital. Um, if we kind of look at the, what, what uh, you know, if we look at what uh, the SPDF standards are, um, it, you see that um, the CPP standards, basically, you have almost all the standards in the digital. Next slide. Um, what you have in the, uh, what you have had all the seven principles or now what you call the SPDF standards are very much relevant. You know, they hold relevance in the DFS world as well. And so that is a thing because then that's, that's a few tweaks that need to be done for existing principles. Um, what additionally we found, I think what additionally um, Nitin highlighted is that there are five factors that um, additionally need to be looked at, the agent management algorithm, outcomes and partnerships and cybersecurity. So our study also kind of resonates the same, uh, uh, same results, except that uh, we've not really touched on the outcomes, but more so what we see that uh, that there's a, there's this uh, the approach towards product technology partners and data and cyber security. So these are four lenses I would say that we the way that you start looking at the consumer protection from these different angles. Um, and uh, so automation uh, basically again in an analog world, as I said that you know you consumers interact with human beings, but in the in the digital world clients mostly interact with the product. So it's it's instead of the humans, it's the product itself. Um, data is used by machines to support customers. So there's the data that comes into, you have chatbots, and then you have machine learning and algorithms to do the underwriting. Um, in the world, again, you know, you can't be in a world that's fully digitized. And uh, so therefore, uh, even within a digitized space and the human touch space, you have multiple partners. So DFS providers have multiple partners which with whom they partner with. Um, and then uh, you have new products. So the products are kind of ever changing. That's what we uh, discovered that, you know, the, the products are increasing so fast that, um, you know, each every now and then, you know, there's a different use case. Uh, uh, so uh, that's that overall change, and um, the next slide really kind of gives you an overview of uh, 
uh, just I'm going to take 30 seconds on this, but it shows you the impact of innovations of financial services. It shows you how uh, things have changed from an analog to digital world and what is uh, you know what is the 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 scope of digitization for different services so as you pay there is high digitization uh, for saving but um, well borrowing again there's high level of digitization that can happen but for saving that's low um, so that that's all on that slide please um, next slide please Okay, so I just want to show you this whole echo space, which is very complicated. As you see there, when we talk of DFS lenders, it's not just digital lenders, but it's online lenders, it's P2P platforms. Um, you have a marketplace and supply chain lenders, and the DFS standards that we are going to have from are going to be applied to all of these models. And so, how do you start doing that? Uh, is the question. So, next slide, please. Uh, in this section, we see, you know, so here what we try and do is how unbundle uh, the business models, then start assessing what risks are there and what mitigants can be um, can be there, there for institutions. So if you're looking at the products um, uh, slide, then, you know, the risks that you generally see are products are, um, you know, yeah, so products related. Uh, so I'm going to talk about product related risks. And the products are poorly designed. Um, good product designs are next slide. Pro, so the good product uh, is is key, and clients are exposed to a lot of risk if uh, products are designed poorly. Um, and what you know, what does so if a product is not designed appropriately, what kind of risk it generates? Um, so clients uh, are not as protected as they used to be with humans. I think. Um, key protections that would be previously handled by the FSP staff, like transparency, redress, as Nitin mentioned, uh, they now need to be handled at the product design stage itself. Um, again, clients are not, you know, when when it comes to a human uh, analog world, you know, clients are protected by default. In a digital world, the fact that you know that a client would need to change the the product default parameters. Um, to to kind of get protected, and that puts them at an additional risk. So design itself doesn't take care of the client protection part of it. Um, clients can't talk to humans if needed. If product design does not give clients the ability to talk to humans as needed, that that's one of the risks that's being seen. Um, and again, you know, uh, some of the times there's no research that's been done on whether the client has the capabilities to interact with a certain uh, technology or not. Um, so when we look at the mitigants, so we just think that um, it is very uh, kind of uh, known that uh, a good product design, you need to get all the protections at the default stage. And then, you know, it, it can needs to be escalated to humans. So when the product is designed itself, um, protections have to be built into the product um, design stage. So the client interaction basically shifts to the product. So it's critical to introduce these concepts of consumer protection at this stage. Um, consumer protection by default should be built into design. And then of course, the stability aspect um, also holds very much relevance. That means the digital readiness, uh, pay attention to the capabilities, mobile in in ownership, um, et cetera. So uh, this is what we basically uh, kind of look here. Um, so, from the MCRIS perspective, I think what we are trying to do is uh, looking at what are the products. The first thing is unbundling for this of business model. 